welcome back everyone we are here on another flex success podcast i think number five and lucky number yeah very lucky number i'm also here obviously with the, the lovely partner of mine liz and today we're joined by industry professional surfing connoisseur and just a <laughs> good guy <laughs> an osteopathic of gold coast that dean and i both have experience with actually we see nathan personally for our aches and pains. And he has touched both of us in places that neither of us have touched ourselves. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's the magic <laughs> Where only the brave go. Yeah. <laughs> so Nathan, we'll ask you to introduce yourself. Who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? Well, thank you very much for the lovely introduction that you've done. Uh, as you said, uh, I'm an osteopath. I'm based on the Gold Coast. Uh, I run a private practice called Universal Health and Performance in Burley Heads. Uh, my practice is a bit of a mix between um, a quite an active population and then just some general pop. Um, within that active population, I happen to see a lot of strength athletes, bodybuilders, powerlifters, um, crossfitters, you know, like all of that sort of stuff. And then I mix that with quite a few surfers and a few sort of professional and semi-professional athletes from some of the other domains as well. I was listening to a podcast that you recorded with another podcast show and you mentioned that you really like working with athletes or barbell athletes because they give more of a shit um, than Sarah from the office and are more willing to put time into their rehab. And as coaches, we can fully appreciate working with someone that cares a lot more as opposed to trying to work with someone that doesn't give a shit. So totally hear you there. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I often sort of like think it's quite funny because one of my hobbies, as you just mentioned, is surfing. And so naturally, I treat quite a large population of surfers from the Gold Coast who are stereotypically probably some of the least motivated uh, sports people in the world. And then I complement that with bodybuilders and strength athletes who are probably some of the most uh, dedicated and you know willing to participate in rehab you know recovery improving right. their performance all of that sort of stuff so it's a really nice sort of dichotomy that I get to frustrate myself with surfers and then get really good results with that uh, with bodybuilders and do you think that purely comes down to the vanity of the barbell athlete knowing that <laughs> <laughs> they'll look better if they're pain-free well let's not call it oh, absolutely vanity driven a barbell athlete oh that's true well let's not call them athletes I, I know, I think I might piss a few people off here, but I do like to say that <laughs> bodybuilders are muscular beauty pageant contenders. It's true. And just, there we go. yeah, the idea of beauty is a little different there. Yeah. I'm sure you could also get the flip on that too, though. The neuroticism involved with a bodybuilder is probably also the same with, they're like, oh my God, I'm always sore. Like what, I've got this niggle. And then they're just constantly worried about problems all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So where you've got some people who are like, you know, completely nonchalant and that might be the surfers who could pretty much be walking around with a broken leg and are like, I don't need to see anyone versus a bodybuilder who might have a paper cut and comes and sees me thinking that their arm is going to fall off with necrosis or something like that. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but sometimes you do get those, those extremes. Absolutely. Oh, that's paper funny. cuts hurt more than they should. Paper cuts do hurt a lot. But <laughs> <laughs> a good... Um, Got a good analogy about paper cuts that we might get to later when we start talking about some pain. Yeah, so today's topic uh, is pain and uh, something that all of us experience. And Nathan thought this would be a good topic to unwrap so that we can understand it a bit, a bit better and, and be a bit less shit. <laughs> um, but actually, before we get there, so you've explained who you are and what you do, but why do you do it? Oh, good question. Um, I think I've always had a bit of an urge just to help people. Um, even, you know, right the way through my, you know, junior schooling career and things like that, I always found myself to be a bit of an empath, I guess, and was always, you know, drawn towards the want to help or improve people. That might sound a bit cliche, but it's definitely what um, pushed me to, to where I am. Uh, and then mixing that, you know, with my own various injuries and wanting to learn more about the body, how it works, um, and just always striving, you know, down that path of, of questioning and and, um, and looking at the way that I think things are and the way that things really are and sort of mixing those two together, which can be, you know, sometimes at opposite ends. Yeah. Mm. God, we're an interesting machine, aren't we? The yes. Body. <laughs> we don't make sense. 
We know no. it makes sense. And the other crazy thing is like what we learn in theory is almost like not even true sometimes in practice. We we're joking about this with Dalton the other day. We're well, not joking, but talking and discussing about you do an anatomy class mm -hmm. and you're like, what? That doesn't look like anything in the textbook. You know, like <laughs> how could it possibly all be put together? Like you look at a forearm or a lower limb or anything, you just like that is an absolute mess. Well, I did anatomy at uni, right? And um, Dean worked with cadavers in yeah. first year. I didn't work with cadavers um, because I started with a Bachelor of Chiropractic Science and then later switched to Social Science. So I only completed the right. year of my chiro. Mm. Um, and in first year at Macquarie Uni, we didn't work with cadavers. But anyways, Dean did. And looking at textbooks, you know, you see a heart or a liver or whatever. And, and in our exams, we had to walk around and play with the plastic mannequins. And it had a little label like, name this. But Dean got to like open people up, and I'm sure Olivia didn't look like my beautiful plastic. Thing. Well, no, I can never remember. It, but, you know, not everyone has the same amount of muscles in their forearm, and one of them's missing. And then, like sometimes you're like counting it through, and you're like, "What the fuck? That's not even in the textbook. What is that?" And like, oh, wow. There's a small percentage of people that have that one. Well, Dean has an extra rib. Like, yeah, I do. That's weird. There you go. We've just got such a wide, you know, the human body has such a wide variance of, of normal. Like, you know, we think that normal is this one, like, linear pathway, but really there's, like, it's, you know, 10 feet wide and 10 feet tall, yeah. and that's where normal yeah. fits in, and there's, like, you know, all encompassing, basically. I, I often like uh, to say that the average person has one tit and one nut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if we average humans out, it's true. <laughs> I think that's, you know, like, a part of what... Um, you know, it can be really challenging it, it, as far as what you're talking about there. And then you relate that to people like us who look and read research is that even just like looking at the research, it doesn't give you necessarily a clear path or an answer. It gives you maybe a framework to look at and then you have to use your own critical thinking and judgment to sort of decipher how we sort of hone that down to relate that to an individual. And I think that goes the same for an anatomy textbook. You know, it does, you've got to look at that and the, the piece of paper and then look at the person in front of you and decide how am I going to piece that puzzle together? And that's the, uh, the devil's in the detail there for sure. Yeah. yeah. In nutrition and training, we always like refer to it when I've done seminars with Real Crozier of um, those that are like <laughs> legitimate practitioners understand the principles, apply their own protocols. Whereas those that are sort of desktop, you know, warriors that think they know everything, they basically take protocols and just parrot them. Mm. So they only have the opportunity or the ability, I should say, to basically apply one set of protocols to all people because they don't really understand the ins and outs. Whereas, like you said, like when you understand all the bits and pieces, it's the fun and the art and the coach and the true practitioner is the person that's in practice taking everything they've learned from a principal basis and applying it to practice. That's it. That's a really good point. It really is, you know, I think coaching and, you know, like uh, being a practitioner, there's a science and there's an art, as you just mentioned, you know, it's, it's a really good mix of the two and you can't just be all science. I don't think you can just be all art. Some people might like to be, uh, <laughs> but, you know, like mixing those two together, it truly does make a, a great coach and a great clinician. Yep. Just takes a little bit more energy, mm. which not everyone's willing to give, which is why the industry Absolutely. is not saturated with great coaches. That's true. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Now give us an intro to pain. I know that's a very general um, ask, but tell us what would our listeners need to start with to start understanding pain, what it is, how to determine the type. Yeah, what, what's exactly what it? Is. Yeah. Well, that just. Sure. So I might start by sort of like thinking, like getting to describe what the general notion of pain is and contrasting that with a, a bit more of a nuanced sort of version that um, myself and lots of other uh, practitioners have been working off for quite a long time now. So the, the, the typical way that we've looked at it, and we'll call this the biomedical model, and that is that there is a, a linear relationship between pain and damage. So if I cut you, yes, there is damage. Uh, but we have quite a new version of this now in that pain does not always equal damage. Sometimes we've got outside influences that can associate with pain and go on to create pain for longer than we would like um, due to some of those. And we call that the biopsychosocial model. So if we go back to this, you know, typical biomedical model, that's where, you know, a lot of um, 
GPs and maybe just your average person on the street is, is thinking about uh, how things work in their body. Um, and as I said, you know, like sometimes if we maybe you bend over and you feel a bit of a twinge in your back and your brain immediately goes, something must be damaged. But we now know from lots of studies and lots of imaging and things like that, that most of those experiences are not really related to damage, but maybe in part to damage and then maybe in part to how your brain thinks about that, what your psychology is, and then everything that you've had leading up to that. So your past experiences, your, um, your culture growing up, your support networks, your environment, uh, all of those sorts of things. So it's a, it is a really sort of complex, uh, uh, multimodal, multifactorial approach that we now take to pain instead of this sort of like one linear approach. Mm. Uh, and I think it's a really, um, really important thing that um, general population and coaches and other trainers and other allied health professionals um, really need to start thinking about yeah. because we so often just fall back into this biological model. Totally. So you called it the biosocial model, right? Biopsychosocial. Biopsychosocial. Right. Yep. So that would be sort of a biological, sociological and psychological, right? The combination exactly. of the three. Yeah, cool. Can I give yep. an example of what I think might be relevant to what you're saying just so listeners can get a, yeah, an example of that? So uh, as a personal trainer, now online coach, but I was a personal trainer, I used to train all sorts of people from someone who has a desk job to someone who's a really competitive athlete. And I found those who are really competitive athletes versus the desk job person that's never trained before, they can't distinguish between when you, you're like it, your muscles are hurting from an exercise and that's okay to muscles hurt. I have to stop. It's an emergency. And I found that absolute beginners were like, Oh no, 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 no. Like they just wouldn't push because they felt like, they were doing something bad. They were going to tear a muscle, or like their limb was going to fall off or something when they started to feel a bit of pain during a set. Whereas someone who's been training for a while, they almost want and embrace that feeling as part of their, I don't know, part of their therapy of training, perhaps. Yeah. Would that be a good yeah. example of... Uh, that is a really good example. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, probably what you're getting towards there is, you know, the difference between actual damage and just sensitivity yeah. and the untrained as you said people with like a really like young training history and they don't really understand the difference between the two the, mm -hmm. their, their protector meter we'll call it just kind of goes off at the first sign of uh what's this i haven't experienced it before mm -hmm. for someone with a with a really long training age like someone like yourselves you know that you felt it before and so your past experience tells you this isn't bad this happens every time I train and I know I will recover from this. Yeah. Yeah. Could we also then draw that parallel and suggest that perhaps someone with an advanced training age could have a decreased uh, ability to sense legitimate pain versus the perception of just, it's just normal pain. Because lots of bodybuilders and powerlifters really injure themselves and they're like, no, 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 it's fine. It's yeah. Really I'm trying to almost think like, I know um, when they look at even, uh, I've seen a, a cool little representation of pain and the, um, the association of pain being too much to uh, women that have either had a baby versus women that have not been through pregnancy yet. And the perception yeah. of the pain yeah. and their pain threshold heightens astronomically post-pregnancy than what it does pre-pregnancy because their experience or their um, uh, exposure, I should say, to pain prior to pregnancy has been relatively low, let's say, in comparison to pregnancy. So yeah. Human as well to a, uh, an intermediate to advanced lifter, I wonder. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I think sort of what we're, you'd be looking at there is, as you said, is just like how adapted someone's system is to that pain. And you can certainly push that, uh, you know, further towards and improve their, their envelope of function, what we sort of refer that to. And you can certainly expand that, you know, like quite a lot for some of those people. And it does for some athletes become a bit of a problem because they've got uh, quite a wide envelope of function. Um, but Typically, you know, like they also do get to know the difference between good pain and, and bad pain in, in some cases. But pain plays tricks on us as, you know, like it, it, sometimes it's really, really bad for something quite small. And then sometimes it's something that's quite small, but it gives us a whole shit ton of pain. 
And that was the paper cut example that you were talking about before. There we go. It really hurt, but it's really not that bad. Mm. Yeah. So like, you know, I cut you with paper and it's the tiniest, tiniest little cut, but or you stub your toe, that hurts. But it's like, you know, sort My of what's happened overpass. and you can, you can look at it and you know, you can assess the damage and you're like, that's just a paper cut. It's going to hurt like crazy for 30, 40 seconds. And then it calms right down. So mm. that's a, that's a good example of, you know, like a, a whole bunch of sensitivity, uh, but not much damage. Mm. Yeah. Good one. What would be an example of something not being too painful, but really causing a lot of damage? Something not too painful, but causing a lot of damage. Uh, not being relevant to the damage, maybe. Mm. Ah, okay, sure. We see this quite a lot in, um, in lumbar spine imaging. So we know you can see quite a large amount on, a, on a, an MRI or an X-ray of you know, lumbar spine degeneration, disc degeneration, disc bulges and disc herniations. And it looks really nasty on that scan but you can have basically next to no pain. There's no guarantee that that style of what we call damage um, is going to create a, a painful experience. It could predispose someone to it, but until, you know, like say, let's say their function has been sort of exceeded by, you know, what they want to do, um, it probably isn't going to cause pain. But yeah. there's, that's, a, that's probably a, a good one yeah. is that, you know, lots of those spinal degeneration, spinal disc herniations. We, we find them in the painful and non-painful population almost identically. Yeah, mm. right. Hey, so I was uh, going through this book recently called uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. It's a book about s stress and unpacking uh, the impacts on stress on the human body. Even though it sounds like a children's book, it's not. <laughs> and, <laughs> And the book was talking about uh, some people who were born without the perception of pain. And although we might go, oh, how good's that? They'll never feel pain. They're actually really susceptible to injuries because they might have their hand on a hot stove, but they don't feel the pain. So they're like all their skin fries off, for example. What, what is going on there? How, like, I haven't quite gotten to the place that it explains why they can't feel pain. Is that something you can explain to me? Uh... That is definitely uh, like outside of my scope of practice, that one. Um, but there is like a quite a large disconnect, obviously, between what their spinal cord is sensing and the messages that it's sending up to the brain. Right. So they're not getting, you know, a lot of that um, reflexive sort of uh, afferent signals going back up to the brain. But if that, that's a, something you'd probably need to speak to a, a, a neuroscientist or something like that one about as to the actual pathophysiology of that. Yeah. Um, but that's it's it's a it's a good example of we actually need pain. Pain is a good thing. It's our alarm system. Mm. You know, pain can tell you that something is wrong. It doesn't, as we we're just explaining, it doesn't always tell you how much or how bad. So in the instance of a paper cut, it it, it goes off like crazy, but it doesn't tell, and it, and it makes you think that there's a lot, a lot of damage, but there really isn't. Yeah. Um. So it it can tell you like a smoke alarm that there's you know there's a it thinks that there's a fire. Yeah. But there could just be smoke. There could not even be smoke. Sometimes the smoke alarm goes off for, for no bloody good reason. Just Sometimes this is just cooking toast. I, yeah, exactly I right. like to think of myself as an efficient cook. So I turn the heat right up so it cooks faster. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why Australians barbecue. <laughs> Men fast. <laughs> Should be going hard. But well, hopefully that's not your approach to training, that you're not just hitting like, nine, 10 RPE every time. Just like, I'm gonna be really efficient here. Well, I think that's the reason that I'm, I'm not injured very often because I don't train hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> that that's my excuse. Cool. That's an exposure <laughs> to being so like far up the, I suppose the pecking order, like having a real go. So now, oh, I've now been there and done that, your yeah. regression is still most people's like. I used to train balls to walls mainly because I used exercise uh, as a way to de-stress. And God, I feel like I, ha I had a lot of stress in my life. So <laughs> I was trained so hard and man, I just got to the point where I was just so fatigued and I just couldn't recover from what I was doing. And I had so many aches and pains. But anyways, life's easy now and I just train moderately. <laughs> mm. Nice, so you live well, and you learn. Yeah. <laughs> Pain has taught you something there. Mm, it yeah. has. It has. 
paying their Nathan as like a proxy for potentially uh, seeking someone's advice or just like going about it and just recognizing it as something that's occurring and like it's there, but don't so worry about it. When too should much. we seek? Yeah, like help. how can we? Because like you're saying, like pain isn't necessarily damage, you know? Like I can come in and I can see you and I can not have, from what I can tell, muscular damage or a tear or anything like that. But then there's obviously moments within a treatment where there's extreme pain because you're manipulating something that's obviously yep. not quite how it's supposed to be. But then obviously that pain then potentially even provides me with relief later on. So like, when do we know so, you're a practitioner and when not to? When, should, when you should seek help, is that what you're saying, around pain? Mm. Um, well, I guess if you have to ask yourself the question, like, do I need to see someone? That's probably a good, a good time that yes, you do. Mm. Because pain left, um, left wondering can lead us down the, the lane of um, what we call um, catastrophization, And that is not good for pain. If you're constantly thinking about your injury and wondering if it's bad and potentially like spiraling out of control in your head, that is going to increase pain like quite significantly. Um, so I would suggest that you, if you have to ask, you should probably go and get it assessed and at least get your mind put at ease. Um, or, you know, if it is really bad, then, you know, it's good because you've got someone to uh, help, you know, rehab you and give you some advice on how you can manage that best. Mm. Um, so outside of that, the, the sort of red flaggy sort of ones maybe is what you're, you're thinking of um, would be pain that you can't sort of train through or you can't titrate anything down to a comfortable level. Pain that's keeping you awake at night is never a good one. Um, you know, like that really persistent pain that just sort of doesn't go away. Oh, like and him having a partner? <laughs> Can I come you see need to you speak to someone him? about that, Liz. <laughs> we do come and see you together. I would just call it couples counseling. <laughs> it is couples therapy. I think that's part of what I do is, you know, like I'm sort of, you know, like <laughs> well, mediating between you two. No. <laughs> You're my ongoing pain that keeps me awake at night, Dean. Go. <laughs> But yeah, certainly there, there are things like that. I guess if you have to question it, sometimes just, you know, you need to listen to your gut too. Like if something doesn't feel right, then go and get it assessed, basically. Don't, don't leave yourself wondering, you know, maybe this could be nothing and I can just push through it or maybe it's not. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, then, then certainly go and, go and get it looked at, basically. And worst case, you've spent a few bucks and it's nothing, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, you get, you get a diagnosis that it's nothing uh and or nothing too much to worry about uh and you get you know hopefully with, with a good practitioner you get someone who can sort of guide you to like what you should the steps you should take to help calm that down and sort of reintegrate back into your normal activities because the longer that you are left out of your activities once again a bit like uh catastrophization if you stop doing your regular things because of pain yeah that then yeah has a negative feedback loop into pain because they're part of your coping mechanisms. Mm. Mm, absolutely. So yeah. I have seen many practitioners in my time. Um, and what I loved about like our sessions with you, Nathan, is that you did give me um, active intervention or homework or exercises to do outside of our sessions to deal with my ongoing pain. And for those listening, my ongoing pain was my extremely selfish and overactive traps that were always tight. So much so that um, when Dean and I were in Europe, I couldn't even carry a handbag. Dean would have to hold my bag because any weight could deadlift like a champion. I could do stuff in the gym. I would pay for it later. But in my everyday life, I was so limited in the things that I could do. And practitioners in the past, you know, given me an adjustment, given me a massage, done some needling. Okay, we'll see you every week for the next 10 weeks. Um, and nothing really, nothing really worked. There were theories and whatever. Um, but when I came to see you, you gave me things to practice outside and it took what, two sessions. And I, the pain that was every single day, most hours of the day, I don't even think about it anymore. Mm. Maybe every third day I might get a little reminder and then it goes away because I'm on top of my rehab work. So I really loved that about our sessions. And uh, I can say firsthand how, mm, I won't say destructive, how much ongoing pain interrupts someone's life. Mm. Even just trying to focus when I'm writing an email 
Like, why would I be in pain when I'm writing an email? I'm 30 years old and healthy. Like, it just, it seems ridiculous. It's like getting on top of your pain, even though I always said to myself, oh, it's fine, it's manageable, because I, I wrote it off because I felt like I've tried, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, it is very disturbing. Yeah, but that was, that yeah. was an interesting one too, because most people, I think, associate pain with the necessity then to either rest or regress. Whereas Liz actually had to progress training into traps. Yeah. So That's she right. was extremely strong through them. And they're meaty. They're large, meaty traps. But posturally. <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> yeah. you know, Well-defined so. traps. Mm. Hey. Yeah. So it's, what Nathan got me to do was actually work on my trap strength. Because I always avoided, I ended up avoiding deadlifts, avoiding you know, um, lunges where I was holding dumbbells in my hands. Instead, I would put a barbell on my back. Like anything that would aggravate my traps, I would avoid. But in the end, Nathan got me working my traps more, which seemed counterintuitive to me, but it worked. <laughs> and that was a great deal of faith on, on, on your behalf, you know, like, because I remember kind of, I could see your brain ticking over when I said to you, I want you to go and do some isometric trap strength work. Yeah. See so you being <laughs> like... Okay. All right. <laughs> What's this prick doing? <laughs> like, I just sore. What do you want me to train them for? Every time I train them, they hurt. <laughs> um, but and it's actually, you know, like this is actually quite a nice example of probably what we could say might be tissue sensitivity, but not tissue damage. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, uh, especially in the upper traps, it's one that I um, look at a lot for people. I don't always get the amount of success that I had straight away as I did with you. And that is fantastic that we did. And there's probably a few parts in A, that you just trusted me and you did the work. Um, and, and B, that we got um, our hypothesis right, you know, within one or two sort of goes at it. And it, it's yeah. not always that way. When you're talking about long standing, long term pain, uh, you look down a few different avenues and it's, you know, like within the best of our educated ability, it is a little bit of trial and error. Yeah. We just happened to hit the nail on the head, you know, like fairly quickly. And I remember having that conversation with you mm -hmm. that we're going to try this. And if that doesn't work, we're going to try this. And then if that doesn't work, then we're going to try this. So yeah. there's always, you know, a few different um, ideas that you can sort of lead people down. But we just yeah. happened to get there quite quickly for you, which I think was, was really nice. But yeah. that, that sensitivity of the traps, um, it comes in part that like... You're training it, you know, for a long period of time and then all of a sudden they're sore. So you go, okay, I'm not going to train them anymore because they're really sensitive. And then so maybe what happens is that you might train them once every three weeks. And so slowly but surely you are deconditioning and it can be any part of your body, but for you it was your traps, I would say. You would decondition them to the, the amount of stress that you were wanting them to handle. Mm -hmm. And then that crossed over not only from training but to just sitting at a desk because yep. that's sort of like you know, that, that you would feel that sort of pull of your shoulders coming down. And as you said, like a handbag on there would, would go on to increase its sensitivity as well. Yeah. So yeah. the approach that I took for you was just literally desensitizing it. And it's mm -hmm. what we call graded, a graded exposure approach. So we titrate, you know, like the exercise right down to a tolerable level and then start from there and start to work on that sensitivity until those menial tasks like sitting putting a handbag on your shoulder and even training don't become that same sort of painful stimulus anymore. Yeah, totally. It's so funny though, because um, people would be like, Oh, you look so fit. I'm like, dude, I can't even hold a handbag. Like, <laughs> <laughs> not. Meanwhile, I look <laughs> You did look fabulous. I love that you're okay. Um, but Only when I'm moving next to you. I actually was really impressed, Nathan, that you said, mm, I actually don't know why this pain is occurring. I think this might be the case. And it's, some practitioners might not be okay saying that because they're supposed to be the professional that knows everything and, you know, whatever, one, one session and you get a proper diagnosis. But you were so <laughs> comfortable with your abilities that you said, yeah, I mean, I think this could be the case. And if this doesn't work, we'll try something else. And I just found that impressive because every other practitioner was just so sure and then nothing worked. <laughs> <laughs> I think as a professional there, you, you do... Um, you do feel that pressure to give someone that, you know, initial diagnosis and have an answer for everything. Yeah. But as you rightly pointed out, when you're on the other side of that desk, you don't really care. If someone says, I don't know, but we can try this, this, and this yeah. and explain yeah. why, uh, 
that I think brings with it a whole lot of respect. You yeah. know, like it, it, that, that initial notion that oh, I'm going to look dumb because I said I don't know to this person, yeah. it doesn't turn out that way at all. They kind of just go, oh, cool. He's, he's, he's honest enough to tell me that he doesn't know. He's not going to fudge through his teeth and, you know, like try and push something that he believes on me. It's just there's trial and error, you know, within a certain scope. We still do a really good history. We still do some orthopedic testing and we rule out, you know, doing anything unsafe. And once we've got that, we go, well, we've got a scope of practice here to start working on your pain. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, I think, you know, a, a really good thing to, uh, to come at when we are talking about pain, as I mentioned at the start, not just being a physical damage, that there are the, all these other aspects to pain that influence someone's pain. Actually, I've got a good example of that. Um, my client, Cindy, who's been on board for a while now, she was in her car and all of a sudden got a migraine and uh, tingles down her arm. And that was four weeks ago now. And she thought she was having a heart attack. She thought maybe that was a possibility. So she called the ambulance. And anyways, the follow-up to that was tension headaches. So the doctor put her on antidepressants for tension headaches. I don't know. And then she tried all these different painkillers. The only relief she got is she laid down flat. Um, and from my understanding of a tension headache is when the tension passes, the headache should also soon enough pass. But she was three weeks in bed laying on her back because as soon as she would stand up again, she would get dizzy, a little bit nauseous. Then she had all these different diagnoses. Everyone was sure. The doctors were sure it was a tension headache. Then the Cairo was sure that I think C4, C5 was out. And then the physio had their diet and everyone was sure, and, but nothing was working. Um, and now she went to a neurologist, I think it was, and turns out she has a fluid leak in her spine. That's wow. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, so now she's getting a, a proper treatment, but the problem was instead of the GP saying, I think this is the case, but we should investigate. It was no, this is definitely the reason. Oh, it's been three weeks. You still must be under some sort of tension. Keep resting. Let's stick to or, the dog. Yeah. yeah, right. So <laughs> they were a little bit stubborn in, instead of saying, oh, maybe I was wrong. Let's try this instead. It was yep. just, and then that means that my client was in bed for four weeks. Training was out the window. She's got a wedding coming up um, that she hasn't made progress for. Instead of the practitioner just kind of going through the process of trial and error like you did. Mm. Yeah, exactly right. And also, I think that there's something in there about, you know, like that stubbornness you were talking about and not wanting to admit that you don't know and maybe just referring out to someone who might. Yeah. People, as much as people, uh, as we we're just talking about, they don't mind if you say they don't know, they also really don't mind and love it when you refer on to someone and they get success with someone else. As a practitioner, you kind of think, oh, I, I need to be the answer for everything. But, uh, and, and that they'll never come back to me if I refer them on to someone. I'll, I'll, I'll lose that patient forever. But people really respect those those referrals and and um, you know like giving out you know like uh, your trust to another practitioner works works really really well. And it needs to be done more than than what is done in the industry at the moment for sure, especially well, for those complex cases. Yeah, our goal as online coaches and you as a practitioner is to best help the client. And if that means that someone else can help them best, then I feel as though we have a moral obligation or a responsibility to pass them on. And Absolutely. if you're really struggling that badly for, for clients that you need to hang on to a client that you think you can't help then maybe you're in the wrong job. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. I think, you know, like the, the do no harm, which is sort of like the, the, the motto of the most of the, you know, allied health world, um, it really does need to be adhered to. That's first and foremost is do no harm. And then, you know, after that, do what you need to do. Yeah. Don't do anyone harm, obviously. Yeah. Mm. Well, stretching and out that, yeah. recovery or giving them a misdiagnosis, I would say, is not adhered to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, shall we wrap up our talk on pain and start with our segments? Or do you want to talk about yeah. your osteolysis pain? No, that's okay. Is there any take-home points we can give people, I suppose, Nath, for um, either like self-management of pain, modalities they can throw out the window, maybe some that they can consider? Uh, <laughs> or any, anything you think it's worth, I suppose, yeah, like practically, what can people take from this about pain and how to manage it? Um, all right, so probably the, the biggest practical take-homes, I would think, uh, you know, like the, this new sort of diagnosis and, and way we look at pain in that 
pain is an experience, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is damage. It's not to say that the biological factors don't matter, but uh, we as coaches and practitioners and general population need to understand that there are other factors that influence our pain and can be just as relevant, but we often just don't look down those pathways. So I'd really encourage people who next time they get a, a twinge or a niggle or something like that, whether it be in the gym or, or not, stop and assess what their situation is leading that led them to that point. We often just go, was this because I didn't warm up or my core wasn't switched on? Uh, but we probably need to be thinking about what's my stress like at the moment? Did I sleep well the night before? Has my nutrition been going really well? Have I been following um, you know, a well-structured training program uh, and taking adequate rest breaks and, and including recovery into my, you know, into my strategy? And, and, and really sort of like hone down on those, those factors for, for pain, not just my form was poor or I didn't warm up properly because they're yeah. probably not the answers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, and what was the other part to, what, what else well, are we uh, There's any modalities that we can throw out of the window? The people modalities we can throw out the window. I'm a, like, you know, I'm a big uh, believer that everything works for someone but it doesn't, you know, like not everything is going to work for everyone. So uh, modalities that you might throw out the window, I, I probably wouldn't, I'm not going to throw people under the bus. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, you oh. can. no, we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Oh, cool. Sorry. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to throw people uh, modalities under the bus, but I think there are explanations for different modalities that are, are no longer helpful. So things like, being you're out of place and we're going to crack you back into place, super unhelpful. Um, it just doesn't happen. It's not the way that things work in the body. There's no such thing as your spine being out of alignment unless you've been in a major car crash and you've actually dislocated your spine like you would your shoulder. Yeah. Things just don't go out of place. But that's not to say that manipulations don't work because as you both know, I use manipulations. Mm. But we use it as a, as a way of, of mediating pain and for its, its neurophysiological influence on the body and how we can you know help someone get out of a really sticky painful situation but they're not long-term solutions to someone's pain yeah. just like any any manual therapy really probably isn't they can certainly help uh, and I use a lot of manual therapy but I make sure that I try and frame my manual therapy as a short-term intervention something that might help you get out of pain now tomorrow and for the next couple of days and then implementing those long-term strategies, which is your active you know, rehab type interventions, improving someone's function, getting them stronger, more resilient, improving you know, like how well that they can self-manage their pain and those sorts of things. That's what we need to be really focusing on, not the, the, you know, the magic bullet of treating pain with a needle or a manipulation or your world's sharpest elbow or you know, whatever it is. <laughs> that's massive for me. I think that's a huge take home is that we've got short-term intervention to get yourself out of immediate pain, followed by a long-term intervention to prevent further pain. Yeah, I think it's not a yeah. sell though, is it? Because um, if we just take chiropractors as an example, um, I know a few of them sell like 10 packs and they sell their you know, adjusting of the back or their needling or something as the cure and that's a good business decision because the person then thinks well I, I have to do this to get out of pain whereas in fact it might be two sessions with them and 10 sessions at home in their lounge room doing you know the rehab exercises but I can see how from a business decision it could be tempting to make the patient think otherwise mm. and I, that might yeah, go a long way in explaining why not everyone does what you do. <laughs> and I think you, with that when you're selling large packs which I think is personally I think it's a bit unethical yeah. but if you're selling someone on 10 sessions straight away your average person whether they went and saw someone 10 times or not would probably be better by the time those 10 sessions was up like right. natural history takes its course yeah. you went with a yeah. sore neck 10 sessions later it would it was better by itself anyway so yeah. but you know, like that person then gets all the glory of like, I fixed you and I did it in only 10 sessions. So, yeah. <laughs> that so true. one could also say, take, take it into account. Yeah. I just hate the preemptive nature of that. Like, I reckon 10 will be, well, it'll be the number. I'm like, is it, does this so happen that it's 10 for everyone? Like, yeah. Why, why is it on your terms in like a type form? Like, clearly it's 10 for everyone. Yeah. It sounds like a business decision to me. 
And as we've just discussed, you know, like pain is on its own terms. They're like, we have, you know, like we can use our, our clinical reasoning and, and past history when someone presents to us with, you know, a typical like, you know, front of shoulder pain or a neck pain or lower back pain and say, on average, you know, like you expect this to take two weeks or three months or something like that. But the way I approach it, and I think it should be done, is just on a case by case basis. You, you go in, you get some treatment and you can go away with some rehab and then you maybe come back. Yeah, maybe you do come back for that second session, you know, fairly quickly uh and then we just kind of go from there it's not i'm definitely going to need to see you twice a week for you know indefinitely until this is better um, yeah. it's an assessment on an assessment yesterday we recorded yeah. a podcast with a flex success client who had lost 20 kilos which was awesome and she said that before coming to flex she had a long list of other diets that she tried and was it jenny craig on her first day i think it was jenny craig or no i don't think it was anyways she went to one of these uh, inductions for this new diet she was going to try. And on her first day, they tried to sign her up for a lifetime membership. And she was thinking, what do you mean? I just want to lose weight and then I no longer to be, need to be a member anymore. But they were so sure that I guess she was going to fail and she was going to need to come back for her lifetime. Yeah, that they tried to sign, like, imagine going to the chiropractor with back pain and he signs you up for a lifetime of sessions. You know, like said someone, you know, you can go away from holidays and then you can come back. You're gonna have a baby and then and you're you gonna have a baby back. and you can come back. <laughs> it's, it's one way of ensuring like adherence and compliance, I guess, but it's just like it's a it's a heavily monetized variation of that. Uh, and I just think that's so unnecessary. Like as you would know, like if you do good work with someone, and like you know, for me it's a much shorter time frame than what it is for you, but you might work with someone for you know an extended period of time and then they get to the point where they go well you've taught me everything i need to know and i can do this now because i've got all of those skills from you yeah. and really i think as practitioners that's what on the allied health and pain side of things we need to be you know giving people skills of how they can self-manage pain not just you have to come back to me every single time this happens yeah. next time it happens try this this and this if it's still there, then come and see me and we'll have a look at it and try a different angle. Yeah, I yeah, love 100%. it. That's absolutely our goal. We want to create permanent positive change and make ourselves as coaches redundant. Mm. So we're trying to pass on skills as well. And I just, I like, I really admire what you guys do in the industry. I'm just going to sort of be like Thanks. interrupt you there to tell you that because you are doing uh, something very different to what a lot of the other people in the industry are doing. Uh, and you take, as I said, I hate this word holistic, but you do take a very holistic approach to training and nutrition and you really encourage people to step back and take a look at things like we're talking about with pain, yeah. take a look at it from a really broad angle and not just calories in, calories out, but you're encouraging people on, on many different aspects of how they can be compliant and get success in those fields. Uh, and I just, I think it's, it's amazing. I really, really like it. Thank it's you. uh it's the biopsychosocial model of nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's, it's fantastic. But yeah. in our holistic approach, there are no incense or salt lamps or uh, crystal That's healing. That's the misguided version of holistic. That's not what Nathan means by yeah. holistic. <laughs> yes. Which is why I hate the word holistic because like someone yeah. goes, "Oh, you're a holistic practitioner." Yeah, exactly right. They expect they're going to walk into a room with or you know organic salted lamps and and magical oils and potions and holistic just means looking at someone from from as many different angles as you can yes yeah. you know you're encompassing the whole person not how organic your elbows are <laughs> are your elbows organic i don't want any elbows touching now yeah. we're going to start on our segments now and we wanted to ask you if you have something worth sharing with our listeners of course, because we've been talking about pain and anatomy and the body, it could be relevant to that, but it doesn't have to be. Be something funny? Sure. Something, funny. Uh, uh, something I'd like to share, probably um, a, a book that we've mentioned before, which is called uh, Pain Explained, which is written by um, a physiotherapist and a professor called Lorimer Mosley, but it's definitely where I started my journey looking down, you know, the, the science of pain and that slightly sort of like, you know, more encompassing view of pain. It's a Holistic. wonderful resource that's good for not just practitioners. It's written in really helpful, easy to understand language with lots of good practical, um, you know, tips and advice for dealing with pain, whether you are, as I said, you know, just a person dealing with pain, whether you're a coach or whether you're a therapist. 
it's a, it's an invaluable resource, resource and one that's really guided my practice and, you know, changed the trajectory of, of how I used to treat, probably coming straight out of university versus how I treat, you know, uh, ongoing. Mm, love it. So after we did have a discussion uh, a week before recording this podcast, you mentioned this book to us and Dean and I are really interested. It looks like a textbook from what we can gather. Is it a textbook? Uh, it's not really a textbook. It, it is just, it's, it's quite thick uh, and that there are lots of different chapters, but no, it's not really a textbook. It is a book that is designed to be read, um, not front to back. You can flip through a chapter to something that's just relevant to you. Uh, and there are like, you know, lots of infographics and lots of pictures yeah. um, and, you know, like just neat ways of, of, um, of explaining pain that makes sense to people. A bit like that paper cut theory, um, that we were talking about before, just you know, like little anecdotes like that that yeah. really help us connect with pain because it's something that's so, um, it's really quite an abstract topic to talk about because yeah. we can't see pain. So having those little anecdotes and the ways that you can connect to it, that they, they really, really help and that will increase your understanding and your awareness of it and, and how we can help people. I'm cool. interested. So Pain Explained by the name, I can't remember. Pain Explained by uh, the, the, the NOI group, N-O-I group. Uh, but the, the lead author on that is uh, Professor Lorimer Mosley. Yeah, cool. we'll pop that in our show notes. Yes, we will. That's awesome. Great, yeah. Now, next segment before the three final questions. We are mm. moving into the No, segment. we've got oh. <laughs> an embarrassing gym story or any sports-related event story. That's right. Embarrassing gym story. Wow. Uh, well, I well, definitely got a, a, a. I'm happy to take a practitioner story, like you've yeah, lent an elbow too difficult and farted something like that. <laughs> <laughs> plenty, of, plenty of those. They happen sort of, you know, probably almost weekly in the, in the, in the treatment <laughs> room. Actually, when you're poking and prodding and turning people into pretzels and but making them do farting. uncomfortable exercises. Mm. <laughs> What's that? They're farting or you're farting? Oh, they are. Maybe, maybe I might let a sneaky one go and blame them. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I've, I've definitely, uh, obviously being, being a surfer, I've uh, more than one occasion had to do the walk of shame back up through the beach into the car park with um, ripped board shorts and all your junk hanging out after a, a particularly um, expressive session of surfing I would say that's probably up there with one of the uh, most awkward things you can do walk past the, you know a, a beach full of people um, all the way back up to the car with with nothing but your your dignity in your hands basically and everything else showing <laughs> I, would swim for a while. I would put my board in front of me and walk with it kind of like long ways yeah <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a good one to do but then you're still exposed from the behind and you yeah. better, uh, bend over and get up and get down. It's, uh, it's you just not constantly the most walk and just wave to people like, yep, this is happening. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> how does one rip their board shorts from front to back while surfing? You get into some pretty, uh, pretty interesting positions while surfing. Uh, there's a lot of mobility and, and um, like squat position required, I guess. And sometimes, probably definitely for me, what you think you're going to do and what you are actually doing are two very different things. So in your head, you know, you're, you're, you're leaning back into a really nice top turn, a big carb, you're going to spray a whole bunch of water everywhere, but really you're just crumpling into a mess and your left leg's going to the right and your right leg's going to the left. And before you know it, your board shorts are uh, upside down and inside out. <laughs> do you think awesome. there's a market for board shorts with elastane? Well, they already exist. Do they? I've already got them. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get on that, yeah, yeah. yeah, but they'd still go. That's a little up. Do you think so? Even with yeah. Like yeah, for sure. Yeah, all right. Yeah, what? yeah. They're, they're well and truly out on the market. But okay. Bike pants surfing, new thing. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's not a good look. surfing. Yeah. But... <laughs> no? Oh, not my bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> now... Uh, if, the, the final round. Yeah, the final round. If you were arrested without any explanation, what would your family and friends do you did? Oh, uh, <laughs> it's probably embarrassing. That I, I would just, they would assume that I was probably, what do you call it? You know, like drunk in public or something like that. I reckon that would just assume. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's that? Drunk and disorderly. 
drunk and disorderly. There you go. But you some sort of public, public nuisance, especially <laughs> if, if, uh, if my fiance Tash had anything to, to say about it. She would assume that. And she's uh, always speaking about that, um, you know, a couple of drinks under my belt and, and my, my confidence starts to come out and I start pushing people's buttons. And, and uh, yeah, it would definitely be uh, a bit of drunk and disorderly, they would, they would assume for me. <laughs> I look forward to having a couple of drinks with you then because all I have to do. <laughs> have a sight of someone's drink. I'm like that much of a lightweight that I see someone drinking and I get drunk. Um, and I feel you look like at it. You I'm a, yeah, I'm a loud drunk. She's an alcohol <laughs> sniffer. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Stay that's away from the, from the scotch. Yeah, I know, right? All right. Uh, next one is, if you could solve any mystery in this world, and it can be any genre whatsoever, what would it be? Any mystery? Oh. God, it would have to be like the meaning of life, wouldn't it? Like, you'd, isn't that what everyone wants to know? I'd love to know what we're here for. What, like, well, actually, maybe even like to better that point, how did we get here? Uh. That's what I'd like to know. So, do you subscribe to Darwinism? Do you think that we just evolved from bacteria? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a creationist by any stretch of the imagination. I, I would assume that, yeah, we slowly evolved from, evolved from one organism to the next un, until we ended up where we are today. Uh, I think, you know, given how adaptable our bodies are, it only makes sense. Like, yeah. you do a whole bunch of lifting weights, you get strong. If, uh, you know, if your body's exposed to a whole different natural environment, then of course it's going to change you know, like what it needs to do to survive. So yeah, I, I do believe that we probably were uh, along the lines of that, you know, Darwinism. I do love though, when people are like, well, we haven't really evolved much in the last hundred years. I'm like, yeah, it's a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> Try a couple of million years, mate. We'll, we'll take a couple of steps back there. Uh... But do you have some questions around that? If that's the mystery that you want solved? Do I have some questions around around evolution if if around the you want solved is how we got oh no you said the meaning of why we're here didn't you mm. Mm. the meaning of why we're here i often you know, I, like uh, it's not really to do with that but I've, I've often got questions about like how did like how far does space go like where's the edge of the unknown whatever it is like did we just hit a wall what happens there where do we go when we die Never. yeah <laughs> What's the, those sorts of things are what sort of like sometimes keep me up at night. <laughs> so there's a Joe Rogan podcast with Richard Dawkins that discusses where we go when we die, um, <clears throat> which you, you might be interested in listening to. I believe yeah. that we just become part of the earth because we can't create or destroy energy and yeah. our energy just becomes the earth's energy. Yeah, there's an epic quote. Yeah, I think it's even on a Rogan podcast too from Neil deGrasse Tyson. And it was a debate around whether or not you would be cremated versus buried. And like, I always yeah. like to shared the same opinion. It's like, well, I probably would get cremated with less space, you know, like we don't really need to be in the ground. What's the point? I'm taking up real estate. You know, but then Neil deGrasse Tyson was like, well, if you are, you know, if you're on the notion of that, like as an organism, we continually evolve and we give back the land and blah, 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 energy sort of ever, you know, just okay. essentially exchanging itself from one thing to another. He's like, the great thing about being buried is that you become the energy to another source to then create new life. Feed worms. And I was like, and God damn, man, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you're, you're the fellow. Like, oh, I'm not buried then. <laughs> Bury me then. Absolutely. And well, like, if, if that's, that's the way that you think about it, it's that like we're just the sum of, of, of all our parts. And then when we die, we just go to nothing. Mm. What happens mm. to our consciousness? Does, it, does the consciousness live on or does that die with us? Stop. This is too deep, and this is. <laughs> I can't answer that question, and I hate having unanswered questions. So yes. stop it. I love. Actually, really love these philosophical questions. Mm. Um, <laughs> I find it hard to switch them off because I love them so much. So there we go. So Plus, they like, go forever. They go forever. Mm. They do. All right. Let's go to a really serious question, then, Liz. All right. Finish it up. Wrap it up. And Nathan, a would you rather? Oh Ooh. no! My would you rather was right here, and I've lost it. All right, Nick, cut this bit out while I'm looking. <laughs> yeah, I got it, got it. All right, so my would you rather. Would you rather have no nipples or have three nipples? Ooh. Well, given that the male nipple probably serves zero purpose, and it can let you I'd know. Probably just rather... Sorry? 
It can let you know when you're cold. So can the other thousand goosebumps on your arm. <laughs> <laughs> let yeah. one big brown. Like the rest of my body. biological mechanisms. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, I'm, I wouldn't be opposed to having three nipples or no nipples. Well, I guess it's probably weird to have no nipples, isn't it? I have three nipples. Fuck it. Where would they be then? Are you going even three? Are you going a double with a single? Or for anyone that's not watching this on YouTube, I am pointing at my chest. While I'm <laughs> just them. Uh, how do you? Do I reckon. You know? I reckon a double and a single. So at least one side's sort of like a little bit normal, and then you've just got one that's a, one that's a two a two dogger. Mm. One on top of the other, or one next to the other. All I, oh, I was I was imagining for symmetry that they're all in a line. Absolutely. Yeah, me too. Okay. One, two, and then the third one, third one over to the side. Yeah, yeah I'd be comfortable with that. You should get uh, do you know what an industrial bar is in the ear? Yeah. Yeah, yes. right. So you should get an industrial bar through both of those nipples side mm. by side. The link the link all of them. <laughs> I was on that topic, I will say that I'm I'm often surprised at the amount of people that um do sports uh Nipple, nipple piercings, like blokes that, you know, like obviously they don their shirt when they, when they come in. I'm like, wow, you've got a nipple piercing. Got them both done, the big bars. No, yeah. other, no other lead in apart from just like these big glaring nipple piercings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My brother's a straighty 180 and got, had both of his nipples done. And then people, do, no, people that do it with sport, then they end up getting them hit and then they have one nipple bigger than the other. And I'm like, man, this is just too oh, different. It's nasty. It's nasty. Yeah, it's a real sort of like late 90s trend, wasn't it? Like the Peter Andre sort of like... Oh, just an APAC. So I think that if you're to have your nipple pierced, it's weird to have both. And the left one is the normal one to pierce. And I think I was having a discussion with Dean about... Was it you about nipple piercings? And you assumed that when you get your nipples done, it's like getting your ears pierced, you get both. Was that me and you? No, I kept just one and left as well, well for some reason. I'd like to put it out there that a double nipple piercing is weird. And stop listening to this podcast because you're a freak if you have a double nipple piercing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it is pretty weird. It's very brave like to do, to do the double. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I'm it's not my... It. I'm less weird about a double nipple piercing. I think it's weird. Mm. I think it's weird. Um, so, Nathan, tell us, where can our listeners find you if they want to find you? Uh, right. So, they can follow me on, on Instagram. I am at thesurfing.osteopath. Uh, you can find me in my clinical practice, which is Universal Health and Performance uh, in Burley. And that's universal-health.com.au is my website. I do all online bookings. If you want to come in and see me and chat about your pain or let me help you sort of decipher what's good and what's bad pain, uh, then there, oh, that's all the places that you can find me. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. Um, now, awesome. Nathan, what have we got going on at Flex to wrap it up? Absolutely nothing. We've cooked ourselves. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> we've <been on> holidays. <laughs> As always, we've reached your pinnacle here. It's only downhill. Sorry, I guys. Know. I know. We're going to retire. No, we're in the final stages of uh, finishing up the audio portion of our ebook, Life After Dieting. So that should be released. And audio book. Yeah. Did I just say, yeah, audio and ebook. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be released by end of November, um, which is really cool. That's our most exciting project currently at Flex. Mm -hmm. And our ongoing um, research review, of course, with the new research review being released every second week. So people who don't have the time to cipher through all the science and learn how to understand it, we'll do it for you. Yep. And of course, we do online coaching. That's kind of what we do. We do a once-off consult if you don't <laughs> want to commit to 12 weeks of coaching. Um, but until next time, listeners, I hope you've gained something helpful and learned how to be a little bit less shit from today's podcast. And thank you for the time, Nathan. It's been great. Cheers, Mike. No worries. Thank you very much for having me, guys. It's been awesome. Bye.